My name is um, Casey Ensminger, and um, I'm the class administrator for this class. Um, I think I've done that four years now, and I've been in BSF about 10 years, and normally I'm like in the background in the back, so coming up on stage is, you know, not my thing. But um, I've been married to Alan for almost 25 years, and we have four children ranging from 20 to eight. We have a set of twins in the middle. Um, but what I wanted to do is, I have a little announcement I want to make, but first I want to tell y'all that next week, of course, is Thanksgiving break, so we will not meet next week. But the tricky thing is, is we're going to do two lessons, so that when we come back on November 29th, we're going to discuss lessons 10 and 11, okay? So you will do two lessons next week, we just won't be here in the building. And then we'll come back together for three weeks, and then we'll have Christmas break, so we'll meet November 29th. December 6th and December 13th, and then we'll have Christmas break and we'll meet again January 10th. So, um, it is that time of year again. It's that time of year when we start asking each other, have you started? Have you started planning your Thanksgiving menu? Have you started shopping for Christmas gifts? Have you started listening to Christmas music? All of a sudden, we have new items to do on our to-do list, and we have extra errands to run. We have more events on our calendars. And the next couple of months, we, you know, we live with a nagging sense that we are forgetting something. If you think back to September when we first got our lesson books, we were all very excited to dive in and discover all that God had in touch for us, or for us to do in this Gospel of John. But, and the fuss and the fun of Thanksgiving and Christmas season, those empty pages can sometimes like fill us with guilt. Instead of anticipation about what we're gonna be able to study, the holidays come at us and they demand our attention and the lesson book just kind of sits there quietly and it really doesn't demand anything from us at all. In BSF, we have a saying, a break from BSF is not a break from God's word. And we encourage you to keep doing your lessons, but also to come up with a plan for how you'll stay in God's Word every day during our Thanksgiving and our Christmas breaks. And that can make us feel guilty when we realize that we've been neglecting our quiet time with God because we're in such a busy time of year. But I want to encourage you with a truth to hang on to during this season. God's opinion of you is not based on you getting your lesson done are on you faithfully opening his word every single day during Christmas break. If you're a believer, his opinion of you is based on his son, Jesus Christ. So when he sees you studying his word, he thinks, I love her. And when he sees you sitting in church, he thinks, I love her. And when he sees you in a traffic jam while you're shopping, he thinks, I love her. And when he sees you standing in line at the post office or the grocery store, he thinks, I love her. And when he sees you making cookies with your kids or your grandchildren, he thinks, I love her. And this one really, really is me. And when he sees you shopping on Amazon, on your phone, when you're supposed to be doing your quiet time, he thinks, I love her. So God's opinion of you is not going to be any different whether you, you get your lessons done or whether you plan to stay in your word during the break. <clears throat> but what he will be different is you. God asks us to love his word and to read it faithfully because it's his gift to us and he uses it to transform us. So if you make time with him a priority over the next couple of months, he has gifts of joy and peace and love to give you through that. And if you don't make time with him a priority during the holidays, don't worry. He'll have those same gifts of joy and peace and love to give you when you're ready to sit down and receive them. So I do hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving break. Thank you, Casey. Hopefully that was some nice encouragement. And interesting enough, she'll, she'll hear it later, the lecture, but... I think she saw part of my lecture already, because we're going to talk about a few of those things. Okay, so you told, hopefully, your neighbor a favorite food that you have during Thanksgiving. So guess what? I might have made you hungry. And are you hungry? Well, we all know what it's like to be hungry. 
From the moment we are born, we've wanted to eat. When my, one of my sons um, was in high school, he had a very strict um, regimen of eating because he wanted to maintain a certain weight to even play football. And I literally, his whole junior and senior year, would get a text around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I could bank on it. And he would ask me, what are we having for dinner, Mom? And so I knew about 3 o'clock every day he was hungry. And when all four of my kids are home, um, we go through food. We go through a lot of food. So God did create our bodies to run on food. And hunger is that warning system telling us when we're getting low. We feel hunger, just like my son did every afternoon. We hear growling at times, and it causes us to think, I need to eat. That is what keeps our body and keeps us alive. Well, today, though, we're going to look at how we are also spiritually hungry. There's a growling in our soul that indicates there's an emptiness inside. We feel hungry, so we do look to something to fill that emptiness inside us. Something to fulfill the hunger pangs in our heart. So in this passage today, you can go ahead and put the outline up. We're going to look at Jesus' first I am statement. And the I am statement is, I am the bread of life. And we're going to see how he tells the crowd before him, the only way to live is to eat the bread of life. Jesus is the only thing to satisfy and to fulfill our soul. So verses 22 through 29, we're going to talk about Jesus sought for bread. And then the remainder, 30 through 40, we're going to talk about how Jesus is the bread of life. So to give us some context of where we're at, we just, the, pre, the very previous day, before verse 22 here, Jesus had just fed, talking of food, 5,000 men plus their families on that hillside. After praying Jesus then turned a meager boy's lunch of five small loaves of bread and two pieces of dry fish to an abundant stream of fish and bread that fed everyone that was hungry. In verses 22 through 24, the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, and they got into the boats and went to Capernaum. They were searching for Jesus. Now, why do you think the people got in boats and traveled across the sea to find Jesus? What were they doing? Was it because they understood Jesus was the one who could quench their spiritual hunger? Did they know he was the one who could fill the emptiness inside their souls? Well, when they find Jesus in verse 25, they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? guess what? They only wanted to know when he had reached Capernaum, and they showed no understanding that he had also just miraculously walked across the lake. Well, Jesus does not answer their question. He went straight to the heart of the matter, exposing the real reason why the crowd had even followed him. And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, You are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves you had your fill. So what is he saying? He's saying that they did not understand the significance of those signs. They did not recognize that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, in whom they should put their trust. They were only following him simply because they had eaten their fill of the loaves he had multiplied. One author said they were moved not by full hearts, but by full bellies. They were only thinking of eating again, physically. Well, guess what? We, too, are often captive to our physical longings. Consider 
how much time, effort, and energy you put into making sure your physical hunger is met. We get up in the morning, and the first thing you think about typically is what you're going to eat or drink. Many of us couldn't even exist without that first cup of coffee. Throughout the day, we're running here, we're running there, and we get our lunch, we get our dinner, we spend time about thinking what we're going to make for dinner, or we head to the store to get the groceries. We have Thanksgiving coming. How many have already made their list or started buying? We make sure we don't go hungry. Well, compare that to how much time and energy and effort you put into making sure your spiritual hunger is met. Do we even think about it every day? Do we focus on what sustains our spiritual lives and nourishes our soul? Even at church, I find myself guilty doing this. Even at church, sometimes we're thinking about anything other than what they're saying about what we want and what we like. Well, in verse 27, a key verse in this passage, Jesus seeks to redirect their thinking and their efforts. And he says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. What does Jesus mean to labor for food that spoils? Of course, Jesus didn't just mean it's just food. It's anything that perishes, anything that wears out, anything of no eternal value or worth. All of that is implied here with food that perishes. Most of this world's treasures, it fades, spoils, rots, deteriorates decreases in value, or can be lost. The meaning is probably similar to Jesus' word in Matthew 6.19, where he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal. So once again, that temporal, anything temporal that the heart can treasure, or even immaterial things like power and prestige or status, all those things, that is food that spoils, that perishes. It will be worthless at death, and it will be useless on judgment day. So Jesus says, do not work for it. Now, nowhere does Jesus show contempt for work, I think hopefully we understand that. He intends for people to work and to provide for their own and others' needs. And we have that in several scriptures. Paul says, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. And that's 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Or Ephesians 4.28 says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he may be able to give to those who are in need. So Jesus does not mean stop working for a livelihood, but rather, in your work, set your eyes on something other than food that spoils. Jesus calls his people to invest their time, their energy, and their resources in spiritual treasures. What are those? People. Good pursuits and things with eternal value. A warning and a truth here with this verse 27. We see that the people were seeking Jesus. They believed in his miracle working power, but Jesus called this seeking, laboring for food that spoils, and he commanded them not to do it. Is it possible to seek Jesus and believe in his power, but be totally lost? and worldly-minded. To relate it to us, maybe, in our situation, that means 
You can call yourself a Christian. You can be a very religious person. And you may have many right doctrines and biblical knowledge, but not be born again. What is missing is the spiritual feeding on Jesus Christ and a submission to his true word. So we must examine ourselves and ask whether we are laboring for the bread that spoils instead of really feasting spiritually on the Lord that we love. Well, in verse 28, like I said, Casey already mentioned this. Well, in verse 28, we have a to-do list. These people wanted a to-do list of the things they could do in their own strength to achieve salvation without giving up their right to direct their own lives. How often do we do that? (laughs) We like to do this. I do. But Jesus said God requires only one work. What was it? We wrote it down in our lesson. To believe in the one he has sent, Jesus Christ. That's it. To believe in the one he has sent, Jesus Christ. Only Christ's righteousness given to us meets God's standard of perfect righteousness. We read in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that we cannot be saved by good works, but only by receiving God's gift of faith. And James 2, 17 through 20 explains that true faith produces God-pleasing works. True faith overflows into practical good works. Many people wrongly think that if the good things they do, your to-do list, if they outweigh the bad, or that they're just better than other people, I'm just better than her over there, then guess what? They think God's going to look favorably upon them. That's a danger. We can overestimate our goodness and underestimate our sinfulness. Jesus did the required work on behalf of all believers when he died on the cross and he rose again. He conquered sin and death. We must believe that Jesus Christ has provided the way to be reconciled to God, that Jesus died as God's sacrifice to atone for the sin of all of us who put their faith in him. Jesus rose again in victory over sin and death. Through his death, Jesus satisfied God's wrath towards me and my sin. He satisfied your wrath towards you and your sin. When I have faith in his work, God declares me right with him. Do you believe in Jesus as your Messiah, the Son of the living God? And that's your first truth. To believe in Jesus is to know true satisfaction. To believe in Jesus is to know true satisfaction. Jesus is the bread that gives life that never ends. The life he gives will never falter, never fade, never fail. Now don't miss the word you. It says, my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. He's speaking to you. That just shows God has given you and me the bread of life. It's free. You don't even have to go to the store and buy it. Take it. Eat it. So once again, I'll ask you, how much time and effort do you put into making sure your spiritual hunger is met? And how do you eat the bread of life? So, typical fickle people, just like you and me, they want another sign. They're like, okay, this sounds, you know, whatever. But I want another sign, Jesus, beyond what they've already witnessed. They bring up the Moses story, 
okay, because that had to do with some food, the Moses and manna example. And when the nation of Israel had journeyed from Egypt to the promised land, to review the story here, God has sustained them with manna. Every morning, they would wake up to see the ground covered with sweet, flaky white bread. The first time they received the manna, they said, when the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. And Moses told them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. And that story's in Exodus 16. God, at that time, sent them bread because he loved them and wanted them to know he would provide for them. Sometimes in our own crisis of life or a trial or a challenge or a struggle, we forget God's past faithfulness. And we forget his promises that sustain us. Well, the manna was a picture of what was to come. Just as God sent his people bread when they were physically hungry, he would send them bread to quench their spiritual hunger. In verse 32, Jesus enlarged the people's perspective beyond that perishable manna that God, not Moses, that God had provided to the true life-giving soul nourishment he came to offer. He's relating it to the past, to today for them. He said, God sent the true bread, and it didn't appear on the ground. The bread was a person, Jesus Christ, sent by God to meet all of their spiritual hunger. In verse 32 through 33, Jesus explains what the true bread is. The bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Here he implies, as he will shortly state explicitly in verse 35, that he is the bread that comes down from heaven. Jesus said that this bread would give life to the world, meaning all people who believe will experience eternal life. Here we have a global offer. And the responsibility of man rises even higher. The responsibility of man to see and believe and to eat the bread of God. But the people's response, it was similar to the woman at the well. They said, sir, give me this, excuse me, first the well I gave the same example she said, the Samaritan woman, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here and draw water. And that was back in John 4. So the crowd, they answer, Always give us this bread. They want him to be just like Moses. Just keep on giving us the bread of God, the manna that fills our stomachs. So the crowd was still looking for ongoing provision for their physical needs, a continuous supply of bread so that they would not have to provide for themselves anymore. They missed his message again. Jesus has said, in essence, you are after more bread, but it won't last. The bread you want may fill you up for the moment, but it will be temporary. Bread may sustain your life, but only for a time. The bread couldn't keep them alive indefinitely. The bread we often crave never lasts long enough. All of the physical things we look to for meaning to fill the emptiness eventually will fade. In verse 35, we have the first of seven that we're going to learn. I am statements. Since the crowd misunderstood the nature of the true bread of which Jesus spoke, he just declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, 
and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Those who come to Jesus, that is, those who believe in him, are brought into relationship with God, and their hunger and their thirst to know God are satisfied. True security in life comes through belief in Jesus. Soul satisfaction only comes from Jesus. Nothing from this world can give. To believe it, to believe in this soul-satisfying Jesus, you have to internalize that truth about Jesus. It's to receive him into your soul. Thinking about Jesus is not the same as believing. Knowing facts about Jesus is not the same as believing. Understanding how Jesus saves a person is not the same as believing. Believing is placing all of your hope on him to sustain you. It's placing all of your confidence in him as the only one who can give you life and strength in a future. In these verses 30 through 36, we are looking at, the, at things from the side of man's responsibility. We come to Jesus to have our hunger stilled. Our responsibility is to receive that bread, receive what God offers. But sadly, the crowd predominantly chose to reject the, the bread of life in verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. They didn't believe. They didn't come and eat to their soul's satisfaction. God offered his son, the man who is responsible to see and believe, and they don't. Well, has the saving purpose of God failed here? No. In verses 37 through 40, the remaining part here, we will see that God is sovereign over the work of a person's salvation. And he will not let his ultimate purpose for anyone fail. He never does. God will use the gospel to draw the elect to saving faith. That word election, we studied a little bit more as leaders, and that was our doctrine actually we studied, election. And I'm not talking about those things that happen every two years or the thing that's going to happen next year, <laughs> those political elections. <laughs> no, I'm talking about biblical election, and this is covered here in this, these verses, 37. And I didn't realize until I really started studying how often it is in the Bible, elect, election, um, chosen. Um, it's often. You can use a whole study about it, and there's a lot out there on it. Okay, so I don't want to get caught up in all that doctrine because there's contrasting sides. You can go Calvinistic, you can go Arminian, and we could go on and on, and we could go to seminary today. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to study what it says right here in our scripture because God's word is true. What is election? Election is defined as an account of any foreseen merit in them. I'm sorry. Let me start that over. I didn't read that right. Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. Election, God's absolute sovereignty in salvation. And that can be difficult to embrace. But my eyes were opened more when I studied it. And I realized how vital it is for us Christians to embrace God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is the wisdom, the justice, and the grace of God's will. And it is always the ultimate explanation of what happens in the world. All of it. Humans 
us, we are not God. And from this I would tell you that not all things are good for us to know. And so God has not revealed them to us. And there are some things that are good for us to know, even when we can't explain them fully or understand them fully. We have a finite mind. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. There are things God does not intend for us to know. James 4.14 says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. This is true with the doctrine of election. Our finite minds, guess what? We're very pragmatic. We're very demanding. Often we want to know. We wrestle. But sometimes we must simply learn something because God says it's true. And it's in the Bible. His word is true. The issue boils down to trust. Do you trust that God has revealed what is good for you and me to know? In verse 37 through 40, we will see that God is sovereign over the work of a person's salvation, and he will not let his ultimate purpose for anyone fail. And he uses the gospel to draw the elect to a saving faith. In verse 37, it says, All who the Father has given to the Son will come to him. Jesus will never turn away anyone who comes to him. And in verse 39, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me. God does not wait for his chosen ones to come to Jesus. God gives them to Jesus. God chooses them for his own. And God gives them to his son. Because God gives them to Jesus, they come to Jesus. Jesus does not say that because people come to Jesus and believe on Jesus, God therefore gives them to the Son. No. Those whom the Father gives to the Son come to the Son. He secures their coming. He works their coming. He guarantees their coming. When you came to Christ, God brought you. When you believed, it was God opening your eyes. When Jesus was understandable to you, you didn't make Jesus look all satisfying to your heart. God did. We do nothing. And when God did that, you came freely with all your resistance overcome. Those given to Jesus are kept by Jesus. It says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The giving and the coming are the Father's sovereign work. And the keeping is the Son Jesus' sovereign work. You will be kept. Verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Jesus will lose no one who comes to him, no one. If the Father gives us and therefore we come to the Son, the Son will never lose us or reject us. The life we have in the Son, as it says in verse 40, is eternal life, not temporary. It cannot be lost. We are as secure as the Father and the Son are God. And Jesus will raise us from the dead on the last day. And the foundation of it all is the will of God. Verse 38 again, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. It is God's sovereign will. Verse 39 says it again, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus will not fail to keep us and raise us because it is the sovereign will of God. 
For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. It is God's sovereign will. Isaiah tells us, I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. So what's the response to this revelation? It's right there in his word. Election is wholly a result of God's mercy, but we're responsible to respond. Divine sovereignty doesn't negate human responsibility. As fiercely as Jesus proclaims the sovereignty of God, he also welcomes sinners to come to him for salvation. It's not our duty to try to guess who the elect are, but it is our duty as in the Great Commission, to share the gospel faithfully and to believe it ourselves. It is to make you humble and fearless and loving in the absolute security of Jesus. The more I read and studied, thankfulness, confidence, encouragement, joy, gratitude, peace, all these motions overflowed when I understood John 6 and the sovereignty of God. And if you ask, how can I know if I'm among the chosen ones? How can I know that I've been given to Jesus and that he will keep me and raise me? We have our answer in his word. 35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And in verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. If you come to him like this, you have been given to the Son, and you will be kept, secure, and raised on the last day. Amen. Your last truth. Jesus alone offers salvation, satisfaction, and security to those who believe in him. Jesus alone offers salvation, satisfaction, and security to those who believe in him. I'm going to close with just a sweet song that has a lot of meaning to me. After studying this, I just, I finally sat down and was quiet, and all I could think of was, just give me Jesus. I don't need my Thanksgiving list. I don't need all my worries or cares. I need nothing of the world. Just give me Jesus. And this is one of my very favorite songs. I might cry because I always would cry when I hear it. My oldest son had the privilege to sing with the American Boy Choir in Princeton for two years when he was a young boy. And they sing, Give Me Jesus. Um, and it is the most beautiful rendition, and this is him with his choir actually singing because they um, recorded. So I hopefully, I'm going to end with this, just it's Give Me Jesus.
Thanks, y'all, for listening. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving.